we plan, finally, we plan on, on going until about 8.30 p.m. this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few meeting controls for folks who are not familiar with Zoom. We have closed captions for this meeting. By default, subtitles should be should be appearing at the bottom of your screen. If you do not see these captions, please press the closed caption button to get them started. If you have a clarifying question, please type it into the chat during during the during or following the presentation. And our staff member named technical support can assist you. We have an ASL interpreter. If you would like to view the ASL interpreter at all times, keep your view your view settings in gallery mode. It should be it, it should be the default setting. You can change this by clicking the bottom that says gallery mode at the top right of your screen. Gallery mode shows all presenters on the screen together. This ensures you can see the interpreter as well as the speaker. If the speaker, if a, if a presenter is sharing slides, the view will change. Your screen will primarily display the slides with the presenters and interpreters video moving to be to be the small to be at the top small right corner of your screen. Often the default setting will show only the speaker, not the ASL interpreter. To change this, you can pin the interpreter's video. To do this, click the ellipses at the top right of corner of the interpreter's video and select pin video. You will need to repeat this process each time to in switch interpreters. We're also offering Spanish and Chinese interpretation this evening. You will notice a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Please select English and drop down in the, in the drop down menu if you wish to remain in the English room. And the same applies to the two other languages. You will be able to see the presentation, but only hear the audio in the language that you have selected. I'd now like to introduce Jillian Linnell, our Director of Capital Planning. Good evening, everyone. And as Angel already mentioned, thank you so much for joining us this evening for our third public meeting on the MBTA's proposed fiscal year 23 to 27 capital investment plan. Um, we are going to do a quick brief presentation for the first half of this meeting, and then we will have plenty of time at the end to hear from all of you. So to get us started, the five-year capital investment program is a, a short-term financially constrained investment program that funds the planning, construction, and capital maintenance of assets across the MBTA. It is a rolling five-year plan that is updated annually. Next slide, please. To help set the stage for what is included in the MBTA CIP, this slide offers a high level look at the MBTA system, which includes three heavy rail lines, two light rail lines, bus, commuter rail, ferry, and the ride, which is the MBTA's paratransit service. Also included on this slide, um, thank you are the number of stations or stops on each of those lines, the total number of vehicles in our inventory that provide service across the different modes, and the total number of riders reflected as an average of weekday trips as of October 2019 and October 2021. Next slide, please. Thanks. Over the last five to seven years, the MBTA has dramatically increased our overall capital investment. In fiscal year 21, the MBTA achieved a record $1.9 billion in capital spend, which reflects a significant achievement and puts us on a strong path to building a more reliable and dependable MBTA. This spend is the outcome of a number of major capital programs and projects that are on a trajectory for success and a number of transformation and expansion programs that are still underway. Next slide, please. Looking more closely at the fiscal year 23 to 27 capital investment plan, this year the MBTA has published a standalone or MBTA only CIP that is also the first five year plan published since the fiscal year 20 to 24 CIP. In fiscal years 21 and 22, due to the ongoing COVID pandemic, the MBTA, along with our partners at MassDOT, published a one year maintenance of effort CIP 
which focused on continuing programs already underway and some key targeted investments for the future. Each year, the MBTA undertakes a robust process that strives to build a capital plan that reflects a balanced portfolio of investments. The key steps in developing this plan are outlined here. The process begins with the collection of updated cash flows for existing projects, which inform our understanding of available sources and our estimated funding level across the five-year window. We conduct a call for projects where sponsors from MBTA departments submit requests for funds. These requests include new capital projects and or additional funds for existing projects. All requests are scored by small cross-functional evaluation teams using eight criteria that include system preservation, mobility, cost effectiveness, environmental and health effects, policy support, social equity, economic impact, and safety. The CIP is sorted into distinct programs and in advance of prioritizing investments, program sizes are set based on agency goals and priorities. Using the results of project scoring, prioritization meetings are held with MBTA leadership to determine project priorities within each of the CIP programs. Projects are then incorporated into the five-year CIP based on priority, agency capacity, and availability of funds. Can we go back to the previous slide? Thanks. We are here tonight because we are now approaching the final step in the process with the release of the proposed CIP for public comment. And following the public comment period, the plan will be finalized and presented to the full MBTA board for approval. Next slide, please. The MBTA CIP is often referred to as a priority-driven investment strategy and is aligned with the priorities and program structure that is consistent across MassDOT and all MassDOT divisions. The 23 to 27 CIP includes two overarching priorities. First is the reliability and modernization of the transit system. And secondly, is the expansion of the transportation network to increase capacity and multimodal options. The next level of organization or below the overarching priorities and programs, sorry, below the overarching priorities are the programs. The CIP includes 10 investment programs, which are sized annually based on agency priorities and available resources. Programs under the reliability and modernization priority are largely asset-based, and the programs under the expansion priority fund the planning, design, and construction of key expansion projects, including South Post Rail and Green Line Extension. Next slide, please. Moving into how the MBTA funds our capital projects, this slide offers a high level summary of the sources that support the capital program, which are broken down into four primary categories. Starting with federal funds, the MBTA receives formula funding through three programs administered by the Federal Transit Administration, each with their own unique goals and objectives. They are the Urbanized Area Program, or what we commonly refer to as Section 5307, the Bus and Bus Facilities Program, or Section 5339, and the State of Good Repair Program, which is Section 5337. These three formula programs provide predictable annual funding levels to support the MBTA's capital program. In addition, I'm sorry. I'm pausing to let our ASL interpreter keep us, <laughs> just letting you know. Um, in addition, the MBTA is eligible and is often awarded competitive funding grants from a range of federal agencies, including USDOT, FTA, and FRA. And once awarded, those funds are reflected as sources in the CIP. Moving on to state sources, 
The MBTA currently receives state funding as either Commonwealth Rail Enhancement Bonds or Commonwealth General Obligation Bond Proceeds, which are also known as bond cap both of which support specific projects such as South Coast Rail Phase 1, GLX, Red Line Orange Line Vehicle and Infrastructure Improvements Program, and the procurement of bi-level commuter rail coaches. The third type of funding included in the CIP are MBTA sources. The first subcategory of MBTA sources are bonds, which broadly includes taxable, tax exempt, and sustainability bonds, which are made available each year to support the capital program. A second component of our MBTA sources are Build America Bureau loans, which the MBTA can pursue to support large, federally eligible capital projects. There are two programs, TIFIA, or the Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, which provides loans for transit projects, or RIF, the Railroad Rehabilitation and Improvement Financing Program, which offers loans to finance railroad infrastructure. There are two more MBTA sources. First is operating budget transfers, which are funds that pass through from the MBTA's operating budget to the capital program. And finally, there is the Capital Maintenance Fund, which is a limited fund held by the authority that may be used at the discretion of the CFO. The final type of funding that the MBTA receives are reimbursable sources or funding from outside sources that are established through partnerships or formal agreements to complete a specific scope of work. Next slide, please. Looking a little more closely at sources, I'll take a moment and discuss the new Federal Transportation Authorization Bill which was signed into law on November 15th, 2021. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or also known as Bill, reauthorized surface transportation programs for federal fiscal years 22 to 26 and provides capital funding to public transit through two channels. First are the federal formula programs and second are the discretionary or competitive grant programs. The source assumptions that were used to develop the five-year proposed CIP do reflect our current estimates of federal formula funding levels under this new authorization, which reflect a new baseline for federal formula funding. The bipartisan infrastructure law also reauthorized a significant number of transit and infrastructure competitive grant programs. We expect these competitive grant programs to run annual funding rounds over the five-year timeframe of the authorization. The MBTA will need to develop and submit an application for each opportunity during each funding round and will compete with transit agencies and other public entities across the country. The MBTA is already and will continue to aggressively pursue all eligible discretionary funding opportunities and we will do so by proactively identifying all opportunities where our capital projects will be eligible. We will then develop grant applications for a capital project that aligns with the program's stated goals and objectives. In doing this, we will strive to seek funding for projects that align with the MBTA stated goals, our strategic mission, and the five-year capital improvement plan which represents the MBTA statement of priorities for capital investments. We will also continue to use the annual CIP development process to establish the pool of projects for which we may develop discretionary grant applications. Next slide, please. Jumping into what is included in the five-year plan, this slide offers a high level summary of the proposed 23 to 27 CIP. As drafted, the proposed five year plan includes 552 capital projects representing $9.4 billion in programmed spend with projects being executed by 32 MBTA departments. Reliability and modernization investments account for the majority of the projects and expected spend across the five year window. 
However, there are also 12 expansion projects representing just under a billion dollars of spend. On the right-hand side, you can see overall priorities as reflected by program size, which demonstrate an ongoing commitment to investing in the MBTA's vehicles, guideway signal and power assets, followed by the agency's maintenance and administrative facilities. Next slide, please. This slide all, um, shows overall investment by mode. And on the right-hand side are the top 15 projects as defined by fiscal year 23 to 27 spent. Many of these are well-known underway investments and include South Coast Rail, GLX, Fair Transformation, a number of notable vehicle procurements, such as the Red Line and Orange Line vehicles, the Green Line Type 10 vehicles, hybrid buses, bi and bi-level coaches. Also included is the Quincy Bus Facility Modernization Project, the Longfellow Approach, the Safety Critical Green Line Train Protection Project, ATC Implementation, and North Station Draw One Bridge Replacement. Next slide, please. The next three slides offer a spotlight on key safety, accessibility, and sustainability and resiliency investments in the capital plan. Starting with safety, there are over 430 safety-related projects in the capital program. This includes projects that are being executed by the safety department, such as the ongoing implementation of the MBTA safety management system. It also includes over 230 projects that will inspect repair and upgrade the MBTA's assets, and over 100 projects that are focused on modernizing our maintenance and operation facilities that will help ensure workforce safety. On the right-hand side, we have noted a number of key safety projects by mode, and I will note that there is a significant amount of information about a number of these projects and many more capital investments on the MBTA's website and as part of the published CIP document. Next slide, please. Moving on, the CIP currently includes over 80 projects with significant accessibility investments, accounting for roughly $1.2 billion of program spending. This includes over 30 projects that will improve accessibility at the MBTA stations and bus stops, which includes small and full-scale upgrades to platform paths of travel, and surfaces. There are also over 35 projects to upgrade and improve our elevators, escalators, and wayfinding at key stations to bring them into compliance with ADA, MAAB, BCIL, and internal guidance and standards. And finally, the CIP includes a number of key vehicle procurements which will result in improved accessibility features. Next slide, please. And finally, a quick look at the range of sustainability and resiliency investments included in the capital plan, which include over 130 projects, accounting for roughly 3.7 billion in program spending. There are over 60 resiliency projects, which include vulnerability assessments, asset management projects and asset hardening to help curb climate change and environmental impact system-wide. There are also over 20 projects related to energy, waste management, and environmental compliance and remediation to ensure efficiency and long-term sustainability and resiliency of our service and facilities. And finally, there are over 35 projects that will procure overhaul and upgrade the MBTA's fleet and facilities for bus electrification, vehicle efficiency, and the reduction of our carbon footprint. Next slide, please. This year, the MBTA developed and released a standalone five-year CIP document, which is shown here, and which is currently available on the MBTA website. The document is structured around three major components, 
First is an overview of the capital plan, including details about what the CIP is, how it is funded, and the annual development process. Second are one-page overviews for each CIP program, which includes summaries of program goals and investment levels by mode. And finally, there is a detailed listing of all capital projects included in the 23 to 27 CIP, including brief project descriptions, the project phase, primary mode, the planned five-year spend, and the total authorized budget. Next slide, please. To accompany the publishing of the CIP document, we are inviting public engagement and comment through multiple channels. Central to the public engagement process are three meetings, all of which will be held or were held virtually. In addition, we'd like to encourage everyone to share their comments using our online public comment tool. And we will also be accepting comments via email or letter. The public comment period will wrap up on April 25th. We will then finalize the 23 to 27 CIP and return to the MBTA board for a vote to approve in May. With that, I will conclude my presentation and we are happy to take any comments. Thank you, Jillian. To make a comment, you must virtually raise your hand. To do this on the computer, please press Alt-Y or click Raise Hand at the bottom center of the Participation tab at the bottom center of your screen. In a mobile device, simply tap Raise Hand button at the bottom center of your screen or on your phone, you can do so by dialing star nine. Once you raise your hand, I'll add you to a queue with others who have also raised their hands. We'll call on the folks on a first come first serve basis. When it is your turn to speak, I will say your name or the name of the last four digits of your phone number and let you know that I am unmuting you. If you're on a computer or mobile device, a box will pop up at the center of your screen. You will need to confirm that you'd like to be unmuted before you begin speaking. If you're on the phone, an automated recording will let you know that you are unmuted. You may speak as soon as the recording finishes. Once you're unmuted, everyone in the meeting can hear you. Before making your comment, please state your name and any organizational affiliation you may have. We ask that you please limit all comments to no more than two minutes. We ask that you only, take, you only make one comment at a time so that we can ensure everyone gets a chance to speak. If you have an additional comment, please raise your right hand again. As soon as you are finished, you will be unmuted again. You may also post comments in the chat and, will, and these will also be documented uh, as part of the meeting record. Please send uh, your comments to ask questions here. With that, I am now going to open up uh, the question in uh, the question portion of today's of today's meeting. Uh, and the first person I am going to call on is Representative Jim Hawkins. And I'm asking to unmute you now. It's a luxury. How many times do I speak and don't unmute myself and nobody hears it? Thank you. Um, Angel, you, you know why I'm here would be for the South Attleboro train station. And I'm very concerned that it's only it's not closed because of lack of ridership it's closed because it was neglected for so long and, and it's no longer safe to use uh the development around the area particularly during COVID, as people move out of boston has gone wild because people think they've got a commuter rail station to go to and at the same time traffic on i-95 is bumper to bumper now has been for a while and these are people that should be on the train if we're going to reduce climate climate change uh, if we're going to be, have to protect our clean air uh, I don't understand this has been put off and put off why this is not on the priority. And I simply ask you to make this a priority on the CIP. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Next, uh, I'm going to ask to unmute uh, Nathaniel Shea, who's representing from uh, Senator Cheney Diaz's office. Uh, Nathaniel, oh, I just lost you on my screen. Bear with me one second. I'm asking you to unmute you now. Nate, you good? Yep. 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Angel. Um, my name is Nathaniel Shea. I'm uh, Senator Sonia Chang Diaz's chief of staff, um, and I'm here to read a statement on her behalf in support of adding the Green Line extension to Hyde Square um, on the E-Line of the MBTA. Um, the Green Line extension to Hyde Square is a project supported by a number of my constituents whose voices and advocacy I want to amplify. The project would invest in public transit for Hyde Square, a designated cultural district and part of Boston's Latin Corner, a vibrant and diverse area of Jamaica Plain and an important merchant district in the city of Boston. As everybody here knows so well, public transit is a public good. It offers mobility and access to opportunity for people in every socioeconomic bracket. It connects our neighborhoods. It offers crucial environmental benefits. This project has the support of a number of businesses, institutions, and com community serving groups in the area who have been advocating for it for years and decades. They have highlighted how this project will lead to more robust and reliable transit, particularly for seniors, make the neighborhood's businesses and services more accessible, and reduce the area's car traffic, which in turn will improve air quality. I'm very glad to see that the, CA the existing CIP includes nearly 86 million in funding to upgrade the stations and improve operations along the E branch of the Green Line. And I hope the MBTA will consider my constituents requests to include the Hyde Square extension as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Next, uh, I am going to call on Kennedy Avery, who's uh, speaking on behalf of Councilor Box Office. Kennedy, I'm asking you to mute you now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you to the T for the presentation. I'm Kennedy Avery here on behalf of Councillor Bach, and I'll read a letter on her behalf. Her letter is as follows. I wanted to write to express my support for a number of improvements featured in the MBTA's five-year capital investment plan. As the Boston City Councilor for District 8, I represent a constituency that largely relies on MBTA infrastructure to get to work, school, and any number of daily functions. While MBTA buses and trains provide for a connected network within most of my district, several aspects of this network are inaccessible to elderly residents and those with mobility challenges. That is why I would like to express my support for the ADA accessible boarding platforms on the E branch from Northeastern Station to Heath Street Station. This is a welcome safety improvement along this corridor, which I hope will lead to further improvements along this corridor and in time an extension to Hyde Square. We need to take every step we can to make our Green Line infrastructure accessible to riders with mobility challenges, both at these stations on the E branch and by pursuing that required accessibility improvements to Heinz Convention Center Station. Additionally, I would like to express my support for the $15 million set aside for early studies on the Red Blue Line connector. Situated at the intersection of Boston and Cambridge and alongside one of our major medical institutions, connecting these two lines would be a significant improvement to the lives of the many transit dependent workers and would be one of the most transformative steps we could take in our subway system to reduce unnecessary car traffic. Finally, I wanted to outline two areas of improvement that have been overlooked in the capital investment plan electrification of the commuter rail, which would improve air quality for my constituents alongside many other Bostonians and restroom accessibility at all MBTA stations, which I hope can become a more consistent element of the capital plan. Thank you for all that you do for the vital public good of our public transportation system and for your consideration of these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Colin Codner from the Lynn Greater Chamber of Commerce. Colin? I'm asking you to meet you now. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Colin Codner. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of the Greater Lynn community, uh, specifically the business community and the residents uh, who work and uh, commute to and from these, this area. Um, two years ago, or three years ago, 2019, um, we met, I, I came before this committee as well, and testified on behalf of the, the corridor from Lynn to Boston, uh, especially that commuter rail corridor where uh, it, is, it ends up being a very much a pass-through for the commuter rail. Um, those stations are so, the trains when they arrive are so full uh, riders cannot board them. Um, they are being charged full rate. Um, it could be up to $15 for a round trip. 
Um, and at that time, the uh, Fiscal Management Control Board, um, through a vote and strong consideration, decided to prioritize what they referred to as the social justice corridor, the corridor between Boston and Lynn on the commuter rail for multiple steps. One being the reduction of cost, the second being the increase of frequency, and the third being a commitment to electrification of those rails in the near term. <clears throat> when we look at this plan, not one of those single issues is addressed. Um, so we've gone in a three year period of time from this being listed in the, the annual report as a number one priority to now not even being uh, considered, not even having a dollar assigned to these three uh, topics. Um, that's my two minutes. Thank you very much for what you've been doing, and I will stop now. Thank you, Mr. Codner. Uh, next, uh, I am going to ask uh, Clark Frazier to unmute. I'm asking him to unmute you now. Okay, I get it. Clark Frazier, I live in Hingham. I think the biggest deficiency the MBTA faces is inability to effectively transfer between services. And although it's not a capital thing, it is. The MBTA should be focusing on having consistent headways so that uh, you don't have to wait 45 minutes for a bus uh, after you've rid ridden the red line. Uh, so the red line, the Mattapan line, all the lines, bus lines that go to the rapid transit should be on consistent and clock face headways. I'm also concerned about lack of double track for the old colony when the commuter rail is extended again, there are already not enough trains from Hingham for me to make round trips. And there will be even fewer trains when we have to stuff more trains in from the South Coast onto that single track. And that should be uh, a high priority and it should be combined with a transfer station at JFK, UMass that has cross-platform connections between commuter rail and uh, the subway. And also it's come up, the green line should be extended to South Station, there's provision for that. And then because the worst problem I have is getting from Hingham to the back bay. I have to spend an extra 45 minutes or to an hour to make that transfer because service is so erratic on both the orange and the green line, especially on Sundays. So that's it. If you want to increase ridership, you have to make for better transfers. That would be the most cost-effective thing that you could do. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Frazier. Yeah, if I can do a quick response there. Um, there is a small amount of money uh, for planning at the moment, and we're getting ready to do some work uh, to bring around uh, hourly clock face service. So we are in process on that. And then secondly, I just did want to say on the North Shore, uh, same thing, we are working through planning and I would note that we did actually move to 30 minutes service on the environmental justice corridor. And that's already happened. So uh, obviously we're now working to improve that even further. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Next, uh, I am going to call on Doug Thompson. Mr. Mr. Thompson, uh, I'm asking of you now. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, hi, thank you, Angel. Yeah, my name is Doug Thompson and I'm actually a candidate for state rep um, on the North Shore, uh, Swampscott, Marblehead and Lynn. And I wanna amplify some of the comments of some of the earlier speakers that the electrification of the commuter rail, uh, especially in the capital budget uh, is a major priority. Uh, I've been out talking with hundreds and hundreds of people in this district and I cannot tell you how many people are telling me over and over again that the fact that the uh, frequency, electrification, parking, et cetera, uh, of the stations around here is of paramount concern to them and is in, inordinately increasing the amount of traffic, people driving to Wonderland instead of being able to access commuter rail. 
So I think, uh, as Colin had said earlier and, and others have expressed, uh, this element missing from the capital plan is of significant concern to those of us in this area. So I hope that the MBTA will relook at that and uh, make some allocations, reallocations uh, to meet that need that has been uh, indicated to be prioritized and has not been yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, next, I'm gonna call on Mr. Jacob Deck. I'm asking him to meet you now. Hello, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I, I, I'm with the uh, MBTA Writer Oversight Committee. Um, I would strongly amplify the voices of everyone here that's been advocating for commuter rail electrification. Um, and also, I would like to suggest that, uh, that the T push for electric multiple unit service on these, these train on the on any electrified commuter rail network. Uh, EMUs accelerate faster, they're cheaper to maintain, they run better, more reliably than locomotive halt service, whether diesel or electric. And in, I think that almost everybody who imagines the T in 50 years or 60 years imagines the T running electrical multiple units. Um, and it, let's make a start on that future now by instead of purchase, uh, the T is planning to electrify at least service up to Lynn on the North Shore, and there's already the wires on the line to Providence. Uh, electric multiple units and electric trains would solve so many of the operational challenges facing these commuter rail lines and would boost ridership and cut emissions and do all sorts of other amazing good things. So strongly support EMUs. Thank you, Mr. Deck. Much appreciated. Uh, next, I'm going to ask to unmute Kunal Butler. Asking to meet you now. Thanks, Angel. I'm Kunal Butler. Um, my comment, I'm going to frame, frame my comment in the issue of climate change and how that's going to impact all of us going forward in the coming decades and future. Uh, kind of three issues I want to bring forth, bring up is the first one and main one being EMUs on the commuter rail. And I'm sure you've heard of their benefits, just supporting all of those benefits and pushing for that to happen uh, under the CIP, as well as looking into reasons why most existing forms of transit are being used. As someone who commutes through Alewife on a daily basis, I can tell you that the average person with a car would never want to use the Alewife busway. It's often covered, uh, filled with birds, and just generally unpleasant, especially in the winter when you have winds off of the route to exit blowing into your face. And in 20, 30 degree weather, that really sucks. Um, generally looking into those issues across the system, across the T, and solving for them either by rebuilding busways, adding indoor seating, and making that overall experience better, as well as exploring previous proposed extensions on the red, orange, a green and blue line across the state to increase the accessibility and the area covered by the MBTA in general. Um, there are tons of regions in the Metro Boston area that don't have frequent or adequate transit and increasing that transit accessibility can increase revenue as well as the overall usage of a system that does a fairly good job connecting a lot of the area but not all of the area. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Butla. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Naftali Poritz uh, to speak. I'm asking you to unmute you now. Hi, my name is Naftali Poritz. Um, I'm a writer, and I, I hear a whole bunch of comments and arguments from like Transit Matters and all these organizations in the Boston area. and they really do want not just communal electrification, but more importantly, better, more frequent urban regional rail service, like at least every like 15 to 10 minutes, which is not currently possible with the current equipment. And I feel the MBT is not committing to what they promised back in 2019. And instead of the alternative five or six in the rail vision, they seem to only be doing alternative one, which is just to maintain the existing like fleet as is and just only running hourly service. I mean, the problem with the existing equipment is that it's slow and efficient and gives off a lot of greenhouse gases and noise. 
plus what's even worse is that is that the um, conductors have like and kiosks have a restrictive boarding policy where you know you can't really just board through any any door you want and it often only means one car and only one car and only one door are open on most trains and they don't even open all the doors not even at high level platforms where they can technically you know automatically open all the doors they they just they force you to have the board only in the ADA car at the front of the train even if the station is a high level platform with power operated doors on every car because of this it kind of ensures that trains will be delayed due to like the bonnet going through like the restrictive number of doors especially due to high ridership such as the Boston Marathon and right now in the intern they sh at, when when it's possible at all high level platforms they should open all all the um, doors remotely and and try to have most of the cars you know open as not to create bottlenecks and and then and then the other thing is if if electrification is is still not feasible then you should maybe tr you know consider like the DMUs that was considered back in 2014 you know or or dual mode diesel electric mobile units including like the, St the Stadler flirts that Textrail have ordered but but will be built to the um, existing platform heights I mean DMUs can operate more frequently and more efficiently than the current heavy equipment that is being used now on the commuter rail. They can also be in hybrid or dual mode as well, including operating on electric power when on the Northeast corridor. DMUs are also quieter and less polluting than diesel locomotives. And, and, and I really think that, that, that it should all be reconsidered for the um, CIP if the electrification is currently not feasible. So does, does any, so Alistar or anyone else, does anyone have any comments on, on that? So uh, just to clarify to you and a few other people have made comments, um, the MBTA remains committed to regional rail transformation phase one as defined by the FMCB. We are proceeding with planning. Um, our current analysis has actually got to the stage of engaging with the vehicle manufacturers. Um, at the moment, we're investigating battery electric multiple units as our long-term goal. Uh, there are other solutions that we might be implementing in the shorter term, but we're also obviously doing our reach on that uh, to work out how we can phase this out. And the key issue is how much um, uh, wire we can put up and what's the most co cost-effective approach to that, because it takes time and money and a lot of environmental process. So we're actually trying to find solutions that don't require as much. And it's not so much a case of not being feasible, it's a case of time and money. So we're obviously trying to find yeah, the best value. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe DMUs could, could be considered in the short term. And, and also in the short term, consider at, at high level platforms, like changing the boarding policy to try to, you know, have all the doors remotely opened and try to open as many cars as possible in order to avoid bottlenecks and delays. Yeah, your, your comment is very much noted um, and we can take that offline. We do have a meeting coming up, uh, but I'd also point out is actually our policy where all sets that are capable, which is not the entire fleet, I hasten to add, uh, on a high level platform to be, uh, all doors to be opened where that uh, we have the correct equipment, so. Yeah, well, um, they, sh they should be doing that like on the old Conley line, especially. And um, that is the case. So, so we'll talk about this next next week. Thank you, Mr. Ports. And thanks. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Melanie Day. I'm asking you to unmute you now. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm fine. My name is Melanie Day. I'm a neighborhood leader for High Park Central River Neighborhood Group, Inc. in High Park. I'm calling because um, we, we deal a lot with trains in our area. The trains, the noisy trains, sometimes my house shake 
all kinds of things be, you know, all kinds of noise that we're experiencing. Just hoping that you can um, somehow lower the noise to help us. Cause like four o'clock in the morning, I'm always getting woken up. Every day it's like, it's like clockwork. So I'm just hoping that somehow we can make the trains much smoother sounding. Okay. I would appreciate it. We will take that back to the engineering team and see what we can do around the noise. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. There are some questions that are here um, in the chat in the chat room. Um, uh, there was a question uh, from. Uh, regarding where can we find a more detailed more detailed information about particular projects i am thinking in particular about this accessibility improvement to various stations and how to find out which stations they are the answer to that is that you can go uh the uh, and see the entire cip document uh with brief descriptions of every project uh additional information uh you can find at mbta.com projects um, and we invite you to go and check our website to get more information on that. Next, I am going to call on, on uh, Mr. Clark Frazier. I'm asking to mute you now. Um, yeah, thank you again. Uh, I was concerned about station access also. I happen to be uh, on the Hingham Sewer Commission. I don't know, uh, we're being at some point going to be tasked to build housing around stations, which means that while it's not part of your capital plan, we'll have to find money possibly to extend sewers. But that's just a something that you think about uh, and sustainability. Some of our stations are in very low lying locations. And so I'm not sure that there should be housing around them, but that, that's something you should think about. I mean, complaint right now about commuter rail stations is a pay by phone parking. I wish you'd switch to easy pass for everybody. I think that the pay by phone discriminates against seniors. And it's also constitutes to me a danger because you might be trying to key in the stuff when you're getting on the ferry and trip and fall into the water or something like that because you're paying more attention to your phone and your environment. So I think that telephone, the phone should not be used for pay for parking. I have a pay by plate, I have a transponder, a lot of people have it, why don't we use it? Uh, and then finally, I'd like to see some provision for feeder service to commuter rail. A lot of the ridership, the bus ridership in Hingham, for example, is reverse commutes, people who work. And uh, those trips probably ought to be free, but there should be commuter rail access because otherwise you can't expand uh, your ridership. And meanwhile, people are building multi-story garages on Route 128, which is just not going to work. So the, the MBTA has capacity, the highway system does not. And uh, I'm hoping you find ways to take advantage of the capacity now rather than waiting. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Frazier. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Colin Codner, who raised his hand again, I'm asking him to mute you now. Thank you. Um, it, I'm following the rules and having a different topic. Um, the topic I want to speak on now is the uh, ferry coming from Lynn. Um, this, uh, we, we have a full-fledged, ready-to-roll uh, ferry terminal. We've, we've actually run a few years of a pilot program. There was a grant in play to purchase and operate a boat um, and that all fell through. Um, ferries, and this is coming from uh, a quote from uh, Joseph Aiello, who used to be the, the chair of the Fiscal Management Control Board. Uh, ferries are the best return on investment for the MBTA in the long term. There's no capital upkeep on the track or anything else. It is just a boat um, and a terminal. A ferry running from Lynn into Boston is going to help offset some of those issues that are on the track right now. 
it can be implemented very quickly. Um, it doesn't have to have a five-year uh, plan in play. Um, it can move forward very fast, can help reduce some of the burden. And anyone who rides the train from Lynn will tell you, you can't board the train in Lynn. It, it is at, by that point, it is already standing room only. Um, so re-implementing the ferry into the Lynn on a $4 billion capital uh, five-year plan, a $10 million line item to get the ferry up and running, fully purchased and operating is very low bar when you talk about the level of outcome that can come out with it. And if you look at the Hull Hingham ferries, these are money makers for the MBTA. The Lynn Ferry can be that as well if the DOT will just invest into it and they will see returns within three to five years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Codner. Next, I'm gonna call him Paul Sanford. I'm gonna ask him to meet you now. Thank you. I would like to begin my statement with a notion on the duality between AM and FM. A long time ago, a science fiction author noted the duality between AM and FM, being that we live in a world of actual machines and science fiction lives in a world of fucking magic. Unfortunately, it would seem that we are insisting on going with the so-called magical perspective. And I say this in regards to battery technology. We still do not have something that can perform as reliably as a public transit network demands. Seasonal temperatures still affect battery performance too highly. Infrastructure upgrades will be significantly larger than any of us can predict. And that's just looking at the SEPTA incidents. In short, there is nothing that works than what is old. Do not be tricked by what is new and shiny. Stick with what works and only do what works. That's all. Uh, thank you for the comments. I would just like to remind folks that uh, when you are called to speak, we just simply ask that we make sure that we are uh, that we are not swearing uh, or using in, in any inappropriate language. Um, thank you for for the comments uh, and just as a reminder of that going forward. Um, uh, again, I don't see anybody else in the queue at the moment. Um, I, uh, if you are planning on having any comments, you can have them put them in the chat or um or you can uh, uh simply just raise your hand uh there is a question that's on the chat that just popped up now um from kate sullivan what are your plans to repair the south Attleboro station on the providence line is it one of the capital projects um the answer that i can give you at the moment uh, uh miss sullivan is that the designer for the construction of that station it is fully funded. Station is close to being 100% designed. Um, and uh, that, that, that is under the CIP capital ID P0178. And again, I would encourage you to take a look at our website at mbta.com slash projects, where you can find more information on that, on that particular station. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do one last round and see if folks have any other questions. Um, and I'm going to look through the chat. And if I do not see any, I think we will we will close for tonight. But just to remind folks that there there's still days out there available to um, uh, to uh, to make public comment on. Mr. Deck, I'm asking you to meet you now. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, here's I. Here's a, a question. Um, what would if the T had far more money 
what would be a project that uh, the organizers and uh, planning folks, uh, Mr. Donahue Rodriguez, uh, other other co-hosts, Mr. Sawyer's, um, if if money was no object, what is one piece of new infrastructure and one piece of organizational change that would help you guys do your jobs better that you'd like to put in CIP? Uh, that's a very interesting question, Mr. Deck. Um, uh, that's not something that I I don't think that I'm that I'm going to comment on. Um, you know, I think I'd like to leave it for other folks here to comment on things that um, that 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 they are that they're um, that they'd like to see uh, be executed at the MBTA. I don't think yeah, my, I'll, my I'll reinforce that we're, we're looking for public comment about yeah, what yeah. you would like. <laughs> yeah, we're we're not we're not here to comment on what we would like. We're here to hear what other folks um, would want to say, and we appreciate appreciate the comment. Uh, Mr. Poritz. Hi, this is Nathalie Poritz again. And this time I would like to make a um, comment in regards to the green line. Um, you know, the first thing is, is I visited, um, you know, the Newton um, Highland Station and, you know, I thought they were supposed to finish the, um, you know, accessibility, but I noticed that it's, you know, it's only like half finished. They didn't, you know, they just, I mean, they started, but they just kind of, you know, just, just left it, you know, half finished. There's only parts of the platform, like, you know, raised well, 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 other parts are just, you know, they haven't really done much to it. So I think they need to finish the, um, the Newton Highlands accessibility pro project. Um, do, you, do you know what's going on with that? I do, I do not uh, I do not know the answer to that. And then and then there's also like another comment I I, I want to make. Um, I know a lot of people definitely want the um, the E line to go to um, Hyde Square, and I'm and I'm definitely for that. And and like and as well as to um, as well as to rebuild South Huntington. Avenue to like, you know, to have like a, you know, center like transit way for both Green Line and, you know, and vehicles and buses. And, and they especially need, would need to rebuild the Heath Street station anyway, because the loop, you know, would not, would not be able to accommodate the um, proposed type 10 trains since, since I assume the type 10 trains would require a slightly like bigger turning radius. And they, they really need to extend it a, about a half mile further from Heath Street down to down to Hyde Square, where South Huntington Avenue, you know, goes into Center Street. And another thing I kind of want to throw in there is, is, you know, a couple things. First, you know, you know that the termination, that inner termination track at Park Street. Well, I think instead of trains, you instead of that being used exclusively for terminating. I think it should also allow, um, you know, green lines using that inner track to continue, you know, to government center. And then another thing is, I think it's very important that, you know, that the silver line that goes from like, you know, down Washington Street in like the South End and Roxbury be replaced with a branch of the green line using that old like, you know, that old tunnel underneath Tremont Street, and then and then constructing a um, you know a median transit way for the um, Green Line vehicles because the Green Line vehicles can um, can are not just zero emission, but they can provide a higher capacity and are just more more efficient, and that should seriously be considered in the CIP, and then it not end there. It can perhaps even replace the Route um, 28 bus down down to Mattapan, and then and then trains continue from Mattapan to Ashmont. I think that should be be looked at and studied in the CIP. Thank you for any comments on that. 
no, I just other than to say, you know, thank you for the comments, and we'll um, we certainly encourage you to review these um, or send your comments through um, uh, the specifics are on your comments uh, to our chat and to our webpage at mbta.com. Um, and uh, we will collect these uh, and present the summary of these to the board um, uh, who will ultimately be making decisions around um, what gets included in the CFP and not. So thank you for your comments, Mr. Ports. You're welcome. I see I'm going to take one last comment from Mr. Doug Thompson. Uh, and after that, I do not see anyone else. So Mr. Thompson, you will get the last uh, word. I'm asking to meet you now. Great. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, with your, it's a little faint. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, just quickly, I wanted to just uh, actually didn't coordinate this, but I want to uh, second the comments about the, the Lynn Ferry and uh, then just ask a question. I'm not sure if you can answer it now, but is there a reason why, given the uh, previous priority that was supposed to be placed on some of these issues that they're falling short? I assume you have some type of scoring regime. Is there, is there a reason that you can help explain why like electrification North Shore or the ferry does, does not kind of rise uh, to the level of support in the draft capital plan? The MBTA undergoes a pretty rigorous process every year of taking in all of the needs and going through a scoring evaluation process in order to prioritize what we are able to include in the capital investment program. Ultimately, we are limited by the amount of funding that we have available along with the priorities as outlined to focus on our state of good repair and the modernization of our existing system. Um, but we do consider all of those um, needs and we have and we are looking for a, our opportunities to continue to advance some of those initiatives in the near term. So there could be planning efforts that are included in the CIP for some of these items even if the project itself is not fully funded. Yes. That, that could be a, at least an initial step that some of these could be taken, right? Yes, and Alistair did mention earlier in the comment period that there are some initial planning efforts underway and funded in the capital program to support commuter rail electrification. I'm sorry, I missed that, thank you. No problem. All right, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, and then I'm gonna close on a comment we got from Mr. Sebastian Liu, uh, who stated, I just wanted to say thank you and I hope the comments made tonight will be highly considered and we can assure you that they will, they will be collected. Um, and again, as a reminder, we have until April 25th, I believe, to uh, make public comments. And again, highly encourage folks uh, to go uh, to our website and to, and to make their voices heard. We do wanna hear from folks uh, regarding uh, the CIP. Um, again, uh, that link will be sent on the, uh, on the chat. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining. We look forward to hearing from more folks. Uh, we've been really happy with the response so far and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you, bye-bye.